Well, good evening, Naval War College, and Happy New Year. Thanks for coming out on this uh, brisk but beautiful January night here in Newport for what's going to be a spectacular lecture. Dr. Jeremy Jackson will discuss how we wrecked the oceans by overfishing, pollution, and climate change, and the implications for our future national security and well-being. Jeremy Jackson is a senior scientist emeritus at the Smithsonian Institution and professor of oceanography emeritus at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And as Teresa and I, being San Diego kids, Scripps, the best. His, he studies human impacts on the oceans and the ecology and paleoecology of tropical and subtropical marine ecosystems. Dr. Jackson is the author of more than 150 scientific publications and eight books. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and American Association for the Advancement of Science. Jackson has received numerous prizes and awards, including most recently the Peterson Medal from Harvard University, the BBVA International Prize in Ecology and Conservation, and the Society for Conservation Biology Leroux Award for Outstanding Contributions to Conservation Biology. Jackson's work on historical overfishing and the collapse of coastal ecosystems was chosen by Discover Magazine as the outstanding scientific achievement of 2001. Island Press just published his latest book, Shifting Baselines, The Past and Future of Ocean Fisheries. Dr. Jeremy Jackson's presentation, Ocean Apocalypse, is the college's academic year 2012-2013 international lecture. The lecture is sponsored by the Naval War College Foundation in memory of Edgar W. Fairchild, a former foundation trustee, through the generosity of Mr. Fairchild's estate. So I'd like to recognize Chairman Pelletier, Vice Chairman Sider, John Odegaard from the foundation, and all the foundation members that are here tonight that's made, that made tonight possible. Ambassador Peters, Admiral Barrera, Carl, all our friends from Admiral Carpenter's here tonight, uh, base commanding officers, it really is an honor to have a giant of science here. You know, I went to graduate school at the Fletcher School. I took this great course called Oceanic History. And uh, we studied the ocean as, I've got to check my notes here, source, highway, and arena. So really here at the Naval War College, we're mostly into the arena part of the ocean. And uh, highway, you know, we've had Maersk executives up here. We've got the people from New York Maritime here tonight. When you think about the ocean as a highway, but tonight, I think we're going to hear about much more than just the ocean as a source, a source of food, a source of, well, Dr. Jeremy Jackson is going to tell us what the ocean is a source of. And we're so lucky. Our last lecture was Jeffrey Immelt, the giant of industry, the CEO of General Electric. We've got our next evening lecture will be, uh, in the spring, will be uh, Justice Antonin Scalia of the Supreme Court. Um, tonight, we got a scientist, another giant. It's a real honor to be the president of the Naval War College for a night like tonight when we can have this enriching educational experience for all of you. So please help me in welcoming back to the Naval War College, Dr. Jeremy Jackson. Am I on? Yeah, I'm on. Um, thank you very much uh, for inviting me back. Uh, I didn't quite believe it when I came here the first time, and I'm, I'm really uh, very pleased to be here. Um, I, by way of, this is a sort of a scary talk or a depressing talk, and, and, and so by way of introduction, I'd, li I'd like to say that I began my life as a as an academic scientist who really wasn't interested in much of anything practical. And, and I was very happy playing with my little organisms and doing basic fundamental research, which I was pretty good at, and, and um, you know, sort of moved along and, and, and had a lot of opportunity. And then one day I woke up and I realized that every single environment I'd ever studied in the ocean either no longer existed or was unrecognizably different from the way it was. Now, that was about 15 years ago, so I was about 55. So that meant that in 30 years of observation, the seagrass communities of Chesapeake Bay, the seagrass 
communities of the Caribbean, the coral reef communities of the Caribbean, the coral communities of, of much of the Western Pacific, no longer in any way, shape, or form resembled the way they had been when I set out to study them. And, you know, that was, um, that was pretty upsetting. And, and so the, the question, the obvious question is, is why? The answer to that is really simple. The, the answer is us. Um, but how could it be that all of us fundamental scientists, <clears throat> excuse me, who were, um, who had been studying the ocean so intensely for a hundred years, how could it have been that we were caught off guard? That we, you know, people were yelling and screaming about the decline of tropical rainforests, and where were we? You know, and, and so I got very into this, and um, it sort of took over my life. And, and the last uh, 15 years, I've been, I've been very much involved in at looking at, at these issues. Now, um, this is going to be the outline of the talk. I'm going to start out by talking about all the stuff we're doing to the oceans, and I'm going to try and keep it really as simple and generalized as possible because the details don't really add much. Then talk about where it's going, which is what I think we all need to be concerned about if for no other reason that lots of us are parents. And then the, the third thing, and, and the briefest thing, is to talk about how we could maybe avoid the, the apocalypse, and you can decide at the end what you think the odds are of that. Um, I don't know how many people in this room, I'd love to know, how many people in this room ever read Silent Spring? Oh, well, you're better than the average uh, college class, but you're still pretty bad. I, um, <laughs> This book changed the world. Jack Kennedy read this book and demanded that immediately that this woman, Rachel Carson, whom nobody had heard anything about, be brought to Washington, D.C. to testify about her book on the effects of DDT on the natural environment. Extraordinarily influential book. And, and then the other thing that happened uh, by my dear um, departed colleague, Charles David Keeling, is the man who for the first time ever measured reliably and accurately the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The result is the famous Keeling curve. Um, and Dave realized within three years what this curve meant because the values were going up. And it was high school physics and chemistry that if you put a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, the atmosphere was going to get warmer. And he wrote a paper about that, which started 50 years of fighting about about global warming and, and, and all the rest of it. But what these two works did was announce the end of nature. That nowhere on earth anymore today is anything natural. Because every place has been so affected by people that the composition of the atmosphere is different, that the composition of the ocean is different, and that's the way it's always going to be. So um, when Carson wrote her book, you know, think back to 1962 and DDT and, and, and this wonderful belief we all had that science could solve all our problems and chemists were at the head of it all. So she knew she was in for trouble when she wrote this book. And if you deconstruct Silent Spring, what you see is that this book is nothing but three simple questions. What's going on in the world that's new, different, and scary because of DDT? What'll happen if we keep on using it? And she wrote about cancer and things like that. And then what could we do differently? Because the thing that was really interesting about Rachel Carson was she offered a solution. She didn't just yell and scream and say, we got to stop. She said, we could do it better. Now, the problem is that half a century later, the questions haven't changed. But the threats are vastly greater than they were in 1962. They're broader, they're more dangerous, and the answers are, I'm going to argue to you, uh, even more frightening. So what we're going to do is ask the same questions that Rachel Carson asked for the first, longest, third uh, part of this talk. talk. What are the most important human impacts on the oceans and their consequences today? 
what's going to happen uh, if we keep on business as usual? Not only for the environment, but for us, because you know there's this myth that somehow or another we, we can ignore the environment to look at what's good for us, but in fact, what's good for the environment is good for us. Among other things, we breathe the environment, we drink the environment, and so we really don't want to breathe toxic stuff and we really don't want to eat, dr uh, drink dirty water. It should be obvious, maybe it isn't. And then what can we do to, to make things be better? So we're going to ask, um, as the Admiral said, we're going to talk about the three major hum impacts on the ocean, overfishing, pollution, and climate change, and then we're going to talk about um, what it means for us. So this, this picture is the result of an enormous effort to reconstruct global fisheries, in this case in the North Atlantic. Red is good, uh, pale blue is bad, um, the great grand banks of, uh, of uh, North America, this whole region, two or, depending on how you count, two or three world wars were fought, among other things, for the cod, which is one of the most valuable natural commodities in the history of the world, um, uh, that were so abundant there. Um, that's the way it was in 1900, and this is the way it is today. Okay, there are not a lot of fish out there anymore. 1900, today. And yet you hear our leaders talk about the fact that overfishing isn't really a problem yet and we don't really need to tell those people that they can't fish everywhere anymore and etc. But most of the fish you eat doesn't come from the United States. It comes from Africa or Antarctica or somewhere else. Look at the label because we don't have a lot of fish left. And you can see that in that map. Um, this is the global status of, status of fish stocks. There are virtually no undeveloped fisheries. There are virtually no developing fisheries. Fisheries in the world today are crashed, overexploited, or fully exploited, and there are more and more people every day. It is not a happy scenario, but but, you know, we've got more and more technology. We have more and more better equipment to find fish. We have more and more better nets. We are now trawling one mile down in the ocean when we used to trawl only 100 feet down. So we're catching more fish. Just the way we caught more and more cod up to the year that the cod population completely collapsed, and that was in the 1980s, and it has never come back. And that's what we're doing. Uh, that's tuna, but it's true of virtually every fishery. And we're utterly oblivious to this. This, one of my favorite students of all time, a woman named Lauren McClenahan, discovered 50 years of trophy photographs from Key West. So what happens is people would go out in the same boat from the same dock, they'd pay a lot of money, they'd go out in the boat, they'd drink a lot of beer, and whoever caught the biggest fish would come back, stick the fish on the board, and, we'd, and, and, you know, they'd win a prize. Well, in the 1950s, the trophy fish virtually every day in the photographs is the Goliath grouper that weighs 200 to 300 pounds. By the 1970s, they're down to big snappers and small groupers. Today, these are the biggest fish that people catch, and they pay more money in 1950 dollars to catch this than they caught they paid to catch that. And you know, look at this guy. I mean, he thinks he's got a really, really big fish. <laughs> uh, it's also turtles, I, I, I'm gonna gloss over this, but um, when Columbus sailed into the Caribbean, and on his second voyage, when he went along the south coast of Cuba in the Jardines de la Reina, and this wonderful description of running into migrating green turtles and having the feeling that there were so many turtles that they were stopping their boats and they could not sail through them. So this student of mine went and spent years in the archives in Spain and whatever, and the long and the short of it is that there were something like 90 million 1,000 pound green turtles in the Caribbean when Columbus discovered America. Now that's more biomass 
than all of the bison in North America before the arrival of the horse and the rifle. That's more biomass than all the mammals in Africa, excluding Homo sapiens. That's a lot of green turtles. They ate something called turtle grass. Turtle grass communities are a disaster now, an eco-catastrophe. Uh, I did my PhD thesis on turtle grass communities in the Caribbean, and I not once saw a green turtle in a turtle grass bed in four years of field research. Nowadays, there, those, oh, those big circles there are about five to six million turtles. We know that because of the butchery that went on and the records, the bureaucratic records that were kept of how many turtles were harvested every year. So it's actually a pretty good number. Uh, I cannot make that number smaller than 50 million. I can easily make it 150 million. So let's just say 90 million. That's a lot of turtles. So that's the way it is today. The big circles now are not, you know, 6 million. They're 500 breeding individuals. So green turtles are ecologically extinct in the Caribbean and all of the ecosystems that were dependent upon them as well. Um, trawling is like dragging a locomotive over, you know, a city or something and knocking the buildings down. Um, that's how we catch shrimp and a lot of fish. You can see trawling from space. And, and so think about this. You're, you're dragging some big, heavy thing the size of a yacht uh, or, you know, a lobster boat, and you're dragging it over the sea floor to get what you can get. Well, that's probably not good for the sea floor, right? And so if you look at the way the seafloor looks before it's trawled, you see all these coral communities of fish. This is what it looks at after one trawling. But this picture is really amazing. So, so think about this. First of all, what are you seeing? You can see these rows like a field of corn that's just been plowed. These rows in the bottom are what's done to the seafloor by a trawl. Now. The area of the ocean floor that looks like this is equivalent to the entire area of land that has been deforested in the history of human beings cutting down trees. Okay, pollution. Let's, let's start out with a thought experiment. Try to imagine Think where you were born, think where you grew up. Try to imagine what the land would be like if all or most of the garbage and the sewage and the toxic waste that was produced where you grew up was not thrown in the ocean, but was piled up in the land next to where you lived. I mean, New York City alone sends barges per day of human sewage out to the deadest dead zone in the global ocean. Um, the ocean is the sewer of humanity, and it has been forever. But there's just more of us now, and so there's a lot more sewage. Um, and so pollution, all these different kinds of things. Um, you know, this is from the, the, the recent oil spill in the Gulf. This is an albatross that ate too many tin cans and plastic bottles until it literally filled up. If you go to Midway or Wake, you see the ground littered with the carcasses of albatrosses that died because they filled up on that stuff. Uh, they feed them, they regurgitate them to their babies who also die. Um, this is an increasingly depressing common sight on the beaches where you grew up, Admiral. Uh, all along the coast of California, we're getting these beachings of large numbers of pinnipeds and other marine mammals. The causes of this are, 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 are very varied, and in fact, if you don't do an autopsy, you usually don't know. A lot of it's due to toxic tides, a lot of it's due to chemicals that have been released into the water, but it's just a very common thing. And then invasive species. This beautiful green plant, this alga, uh, was introduced accidentally into the Mediterranean. And I don't know, there's enough people in this room old enough to remember the movie, The Little Shop of Horrors. Well, this plant is the Little Shop of Horrors plant. 
Um, first it was just really small and pretty, and then it grew and covered more, and then it covered more, and then it covered more. And so now there is a carpet of this, a beautiful green carpet, which is a monoculture which has smothered and killed the corals and the bryozoans and the sponges and all these beautiful organisms on the seafloor in the northwestern Mediterranean, and nothing eats it. So. Okay, uh, but the pollution I want to talk about is something very different. I want to talk about the rise of slime, because all that nutrient stuff that we're putting in the water. Um, so what we're seeing in the coastal oceans around the world are population explosions of phytoplankton, the little microscopic, uh, we'll call them algal cells. And, and the reason these explosions are happening is twofold. One is that there's all this nutrient coming down, say, the Mississippi River, or right here, or the Potomac, you name it. The other reason is that we killed the filter. We have fished out the oysters and all the organisms, the menhaden. There's a big fight now about whether or not we should be allowed to nuke the last menhaden on the planet. Menhaden are filter feeders. With all the oysters gone, menhaden are the last natural bastion of protection in the estuaries of this region. So at any rate, what happens is these phytoplankton grow and they do something very unnatural for phytoplankton. They die of old age because they used to be eaten in, say, 24 hours. But now they sort of live and they die and they fall to the bottom and they rot. And when they rot, they use up all the oxygen. And then anything that can't swim away or get, you know, get out of town dies. Um, and just to make the point about the filter feeders, Chesapeake Bay used to be surrounded by these mountains of oyster shells. Oysters were essentially taken out of the bay by about 1900. At that, before we took out the oysters, the filtering of oysters filtered the equivalent of all of the water in the Chesapeake Bay every two to three days. And we killed that. It's like you had a swimming pool and you turned off the electricity and you didn't have a filter anymore. That's what we did, and, and we did it to Narragansett Bay, and we did it to Boston Harbor, and we did it everywhere. Um, this is the infamous dead zone uh, discovered by Nancy Rabelais, who just got a MacArthur Genius Award for her work on the dead zone. It's a consequence of the booming use of artificial nitrogen fertilizer to grow corn in the Corn Belt, which, by the way, because I'll forget to say it later, we no longer grow food in Iowa. All this production of corn, this miraculous production of corn, one third of it goes to make ethanol, which is an energetically stupid thing to do. One third of it goes to make high fructose corn syrup because there are not enough obese people in America. And one third of it goes to feed hogs to be shipped to Russia. I'm working on a book on that area, and my co-author and I met this really cool, very helpful farmer in Iowa, and he had one book on his shelf in his living room, and it was The Lonely Planet Guide to Russia, because he goes to Russia three times a year to sell hogs. That's doing us a lot of good in America. Uh, I guess it's making him a lot of money. The dead zone is bigger than New Jersey. The dead zone is growing on average every year. As a New Yorker, I could say it smells like New Jersey, but that's not a, a nice thing to say. And, and, and when it happens, you know, it's just very bad news because there's no oxygen. And there are now, when I started giving these talks, I started giving these talks after I wrote this overfishing paper that got all this great attention and, and um, sort of pushed me into this kind of arena. I gave my first talk with overhead projector to, you know, and I realized that doesn't work very well. Uh, and there were 150 dead zones in 2001. Now this increases partly a recognition of what a dead zone is. Uh, it doesn't take um, a PhD to realize where the dead zones are, right? And, and this is definitely out of date because the Chinese economic miracle is creating a continuous dead zone all along the coast 
of China and Japan, uh, but it's just exploding. And Brazil, the economic miracle of South America, will be solid dead zones at the, the rate they're going. Um, now, dead zones aren't dead. Dead zones are a virtual zoo of microbes and jellyfish. And uh, in many places, including the Northwest Atlantic, where there used to be cod, the only fish left to fish are jellyfish. They've become a commercially important crop in the northwestern Atlantic and, and off of the Benguela Current in Africa. Um, I'm actually a paleobiologist, and, and you know the big thing that happened half a billion years ago was the, sort of the explosion of animal life. So after billions of years of nothing but microbes and a few plants and whatever, animals come on the scene and they defeat the jellyfish and whatever. Well, we're reversing half a billion years of life. We're going back to the Precambrian. We're creating oceans that consist of microbes and jellyfish, which is quite an accomplishment in 100 years. Um, this is a terrifying photograph. The Mississippi Delta is over here. Mexico's down here. This is one toxic dinoflagellate bloom made by this pretty little creature. It kills fish. You wouldn't feel very good. This is the same. I love this picture. Um, I, I, I won't tell the story, but I, I just love this picture. This is Carinia coming ashore, you know, and it looks like the sort of the black crud advancing on the town, but it is sort of like that because the wind blows. This is on the west coast of Florida. And, um, and so you get a little bit of breeze and droplets of the seawater get into the air, and people have to leave town. The hospitals fill up with people who have respiratory distress. Anybody who's got asthma or anything is in serious trouble. This, this is retirement homes. This is paradise, right? And, and, and that's what's going on there. And the rise of slime takes many forms. It's this disgusting fisteria thing that, you know, you can wake up one morning and find five million dead fish on your beach. Um, Blue-green algal slime. This one I love because I'm a total Francophile and I've spent more than the last 20 years going to France every year. And this is a war that is going on in Brittany between the farmers who are using too much fertilizer and the fishermen who are trying to fish out there. This is an algal bloom on the land that grew in about a month. And they need bulldozers to get rid of it. Uh, so green algae, the shock wave of green algae. And, and this came to attention because people noticed that seagulls flying over it were falling down dead. And then a cow died or something. And then people got really upset because when you kill a French cow, it's a, <laughs> it's a big deal. Um, okay, climate change. You all know about climate change. We'll, we'll breeze through this. This is the uh, problem du jour. Um, but let's just sort of review what's going on. The Arctic ice caps are going to be gone in the summer within 10 to 30 years. The reason we have a big uncertainty is it's happening so fast. I'll show you a picture in a minute. The acceleration of the disappearance of the summer sea ice is so fast that nobody in their right mind would, would put a real number on it. It could be five years from now. It could be 30 years from now. I would guess 10. Entire ecosystems inhabited by cute things that are used to make stuffed animals to put in your children's or grandchildren's cribs are going to completely disappear. Polar bears and penguins are toast because the ice is going to melt, and that's going to be it. And that's going to happen. That is not reversible. Um, species are galloping towards the poles. As it gets warmer and warmer, you can take a sun bath in Alaska. Uh, coral reefs are dying because of something called coral bleaching and disease I'll talk about briefly. Um, a lot of the organisms, like corals and clams and oysters, make their shells out of basically cement, calcium carbonate, carbon dioxide in the water, makes the pH go down, it makes it more acidic. We call it a Coca-Cola ocean. As a result, it's more work for the organism to make its shell, which means they're in deep trouble. And then what's going to get us? Sea level rise. 
Okay, so these are um, the yellow line. Can you folks see that fine, the lights? Okay. So the yellow line is the 30-year average of the extent of summer sea ice, okay? So including these recent bad years. So it used to be that even in the summertime, there was no northwest passage and there was no northeast passage. This is the way it was in 99, and the Russians almost have a passage, right? And this is the way it is today. I mean, ships can just go through. The experiments are already happening. You guys are going to be worrying about the security of major shipping lanes. I went to a meeting attended by Russians, Americans, Swedes, Norwegians, and I guess a few other, and the Canadians, which was basically who's going to control what? And I mean, you know, Russia and the United States control the Bering Sea. And there's just going to have to be this huge development of international law and everything because the ships will go there. They want to put super tankers through there. Think about an oil spill in the Arctic Ocean. It will happen, so I hope they do a good job. Uh, and then there's all this stuff. So I already talked about the polar bear. I don't think, you know, it's really interesting. What will happen to polar bears? Well, they're already adapting to the fact that there's not enough ice and whatever. So some percentage of them are starting to stay on the land. So I figure there's a future for polar bears in garbage dumps and, you know, eating dogs and stuff like that until people get really angry and who knows. I would say the fate of the polar bear is sort of like the fate of its cousin, the grizzly bear. Um, sometimes it's a bonanza. This gigantic squid used to have its northern limit at San Diego, California, and it is now a major fisheries uh, in Alaska over 30 years. Uh, that's how, the Gulf of Maine got four degrees warmer last summer. Four degrees centigrade last summer. Okay, um, this is the, the acidification, hard to make skeletons thing. I want to talk about coral bleaching because uh, I work on corals. So these beautiful white corals, this is bad news. Uh, so a coral is a symbiosis, you know, between the beautiful branching thing, which is an animal, which is a thin veneer of animal tissue. Think of it as a sea anemone with a skeleton in the center of it. And it's got living in its tissues all these algae we call zooxanthellae, which are symbiotic. The algae makes sugar which is something like 90% of the diet of the coral. The corals give the algae protection from predators and gives them nutrients. So it's really a mutualistic relationship. But mutualism and nature are not, you know, good-hearted. They're based on fear and constant vigilance. So when the temperature gets hot, the little algae can't make sugar. The corals say, you didn't pay the rent. And so they kick the algae out of the coral, which is why they turn white. But, you know, that's sort of a dumb thing to do because without the algae, the corals die. So little, little analogy. Imagine if you went camping on the 4th of July somewhere in New Hampshire or something. And you woke up in the morning and you looked around and 80% of all the trees that you could see that were, you know, uh, angiosperms, had dropped their leaves. So you're sort of freaked out about that, and you come back home, and you turn on the tube, and you discover that 80% of all the trees in North America and Western Europe dropped their leaves. You'd be pretty upset, right? And then a month later, you read in the newspaper, buried somewhere or other, oh, by the way, a quarter of those trees died. So because of something that happened, you know, over a very short period of time, a fifth of all the trees in North America and Western Europe that are not fir and pine and whatever died. So that sounds really amazing, right? But the Indian Ocean is about as big as North America and, uh, and Western Europe. And in 1998, during the El Nino event, 80% of all the corals in the Indian Ocean bleached 
and a quarter of them died. And of course, you all knew about that, right? I mean, that was front page in the New York Times, and people were tearing their hair, and they were really upset. Okay, now, what makes it really worse, and I'm going to just gloss over this, but, you know, it's not like overfishing is a problem, pollution is a problem, and climate change is a problem, because they all interact. From the point of view of a coral or a kelp or something, it's like, oh my God, you hit me with this, now you're hitting me with this, and you're hitting me with this, and it just becomes a... So a bunch of us went on a great trip. Uh, that's the Hawaiian chain. These are the Northern Line Islands, and there were one island with no people, one island with 10 people, um, one island with a couple of thousand, and one island with about 6,000 people. No industry, no agriculture, no fertilizer, no poop. Islands out in the middle of the big Pacific Ocean. And just because of the kinds of fishing that were going on, the place with only 6,000 people looks like this. Virtually no living coral. Notice the abundant fish populations and the, and the covered with seaweed versus that. And that's because of these, these synergisms, because also going on out there is high temperatures that cause the coral bleaching and everything. So, I mean, data say what the pictures were, where you decrease the fish because you eat all the fish, the coral and the pink algae that are good for the corals decrease, and all the bad stuff increases, the bacteria, the viruses, and the other microbes, including nice things like cholera, right, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. We sequenced the water column in this study. And there's this dramatic increase in microbes driven by fishing. And then the you can see a dramatic difference in the resilience because in the place with no people, there's a very low incidence of coral disease as opposed to the places with more people. And there's very high recruitment of healthy baby corals as opposed to the place with a lot of people. So you have this kind of synergistic effect because what's really amazing is this place with virtually no people that is doing so well, um, all that beautiful living coral is in spite of the fact of a, there was a major bleaching event and major mass mortality, but the system recovered, which is what we mean by more resilient. Okay, I'm going to skip over this. And so, so basically what this diagram shows is that this is a bad time to be a coral because we're overfishing and so we're killing the, the herbivores that used to mow the lawn. So you get a lot of seaweed which overgrows and kills the coral. The seaweed also releases a lot of detritus. Think of the smell of the seashore. That's all the organic stuff that's leaking out. That feeds bacteria including disease organisms which kill corals. And there are other pathogens, and then, of course, there's this bleaching due to global warming and pollution. So it's just round and round and round in this vicious, positive feedback loop, which, so, you know, there used to be about 60% live coral cover in the Caribbean. I'm working on this right now. There's 6%. The good news is there's a few places that are protected with 35 and 40% living coral, which is sort of the punchline. And so most Caribbean coral reefs look like that picture. Okay, so let's summarize all this depressing stuff and move on to even better horizons. Um, what we're witnessing, it doesn't matter whether these things are extinct or not. They're ecologically extinct. Those green turtles, we feel good because we're bringing them back but they're no longer mowing the lawn of the turtle grass beds, which means the ecosystem is still sick, right? I mean, you need a lot of cows to graze a field. So we're seeing the ecological extinction of the things we like and the ecosystems we like. We're actually talking about starting to have a, you know, there's the red list of endangered species. We're talking about developing a red list for endangered ecosystems. And coral reefs and kelp forests will be on that list of endangered ecosystems. Okay, and what we're seeing in the place of the creatures we like is population explosions of things like, you know, stingrays and, and, and jellyfish, all the stuff we don't want. So think of them as the rats and the cockroaches of the oceans. 
And then the thing that's really sort of scary is we're stabilizing this new state. So the way to think about that is, remember Humpty Dumpty? Sat in the wall and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. Um, the, scientifically, the greatest challenge we face right now is figuring out how to do intelligent ecosystem restoration because there's a kind of inertia you have to get over. When you've broken the thing, it's a lot harder to fix it than it was to break it. Okay, so what will be the consequences of business as usual? Um, you can sum it up in, in a graph. Um, there used to be a lot of big things, and we ate them. There used to be a lot of three-dimensional structure, kelp forests, coral reefs, mangroves, seagrass beds. They last a lot longer, but they're rapidly disappearing, and what we're getting is dead zones. You can think of that as a first-order model for the future of the oceans. So here's the scenario for the 21st century, and let's get a little specific. Sea surface temperature is probably going to rise 3 to 4 degrees centigrade on average. Most coral reefs are toast, although there's hope for coral reefs in high latitudes, where it'll be cooler, if the acidification doesn't get them. But there's hope. There actually is. Ecological extinction of most commercial fish species. That's already happening in most places. Let's dwell on this, increased ocean stratification. The ocean moves, right? And it turns over, but it turns over very slowly. It takes a thousand years for the ocean to turn over. But how fast are we warming the surface of the ocean? We're warming it really, really fast. And since we're warming it so fast, that virtually none of that heat has the chance to be brought downward into the deeper ocean. Warmer water is lighter water, which means it's even harder to downwell. On top of that, you've got the melting ice in the Antarctic, and on top of that, you have the albedo changing from being white reflecting all that ice to black absorbing all that seawater. And so what you have is a runaway process of creating vast quantities of light, hot seawater that's not being mixed down fast enough. There are two consequences of that. Um, first of all, you know, what goes down has to come up. So upwelling is slowing down. The great fisheries of the world are the upwelling fisheries. So that's decreasing and anoxia in the deep sea. And if that sounds crazy, we know, that we, we know with great confidence that at the end of the Permian, which was about 250 million years ago, when, when by the way, about 93% of all the species on Earth went extinct, the deep ocean was anoxic globally. It's something that can happen. Acidification, I talked about it. Expanding dead zones, you can think about it as the dead zonification of the global coastal ocean. Increasing uncertain changes in global... I mean, if you think I'm, really, I'm, I'm nuts now, I don't dare tell you that, you know, the oxygen cycle and the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle are not permanent givens. They're dependent on photosynthesis and all these natural ecological processes. So do that little thought experiment. And then rapidly accelerating sea level rise, which I believe, you're going to think I'm mad, is our greatest hope. But let me emphasize, if there's any doubters in the room, none of this stuff I just read to you is theory. <clears throat> None of this stuff is models. This is all data. We talk about Woods Hall tonight, scripts. My colleagues go out, and they, you know, they go out on cruises. They measure this stuff. They publish it in routine, boring scientific journals. The pH of the Pacific Ocean 
has dropped by an entire tenth of a unit, you know, in the last 10 years. That's a logarithmic scale. That is a vast change in the properties of the seawater, and it's measured over and over. And if you don't trust Scripps, Woods Hole gets the same answer. I mean, and the Russians get the same answer, and the Chinese get the same answer. Okay, so the, the only question is not whether or not these things are happening, but how fast they are happening, and how much time we have to get smart or to adapt. Um, and it really is fast. The, the, this is a one-page paper that is on my list of the most terrifying papers I've read in 20 years. It's by this mathematical genius from Germany named Ramsdorf and a who's who of global climate scientists, and it's a one-page paper. And what it says is, hey, folks, all the changes that people are arguing about, not only are they happening, but they're happening much faster than we predicted. So, according to the IPCC models that were so controversial, right? So, CO2 is actually increasing. The, the solid blue and red lines are data. The dashed lines are the models. And you can see that CO2 is increasing as predicted. But temperature is increasing much faster than predicted. And sea level rise is off the chart much faster than predicted. Not only that, because of this, this problem of the difficulty of vertically mixing the ocean, huge areas of the ocean are being starved of nutrients and turning into deserts, and it's happening in the North and South Pacific and the North Atl and South Atlantic, so it's happening everywhere. And an area about the size of Texas every year is being turned into a desert, incapable of supporting anything that we're interested in eating um, and, and, but here, so here's where we change, and I'm not going to go in great detail about us versus the natural environment. I, I gave this talk once in New York, and, I, <clears throat> and people were all worried about sea level rise. It would have been tacky to do it last month, but this was before Sandy. <clears throat> and so I, I said, I was looking at it, all these glittering emeralds and everything in the American Museum of Natural History, and I said, you have to understand that actually my heart is on the side of the sea urchins and the oysters. And I said, imagine what a wonderful habitat the number one train is going to be, you know, when it's underwater. Um, but things are really bad right now. And, you know, it's really nice here in Newport, Rhode Island and everything, but I know, I know you all travel. And, and, you know, Mexico right now is an eco-disaster. They're going to lose more than half of their arable land to drought. So we're, lo we're looking at massive drought, thirst, agricultural failure already. And in rich countries like the Republic of California, uh, where we have all those mountains, we used to have the water for free because it used to be snow in the Sierras. Now we have a $20 billion bill to make the reservoirs to hold the water because it snows later and it melts earlier. Right? So even if you got a lot of resources, you're in trouble. Um, we've fought a lot about whether storms are really getting stronger. I think that the balance of opinion now is that there aren't going to be more hurricanes, but there will be more strong ones. I would say that's still a debate. Uh, what's absolutely undebatable is unstoppable sea level rise by one to two meters by 2100. Um, and just think about that. That means two-thirds of Bangladesh. What, how many people live there? 350 million, 400 million people. I mean, it's, okay. So the big question for the future of the oceans, in my opinion, because I don't think anybody's gonna change their ways. We'll talk about that in a minute, but I'm a cynic. I, I, I think the big question is for the future of the oceans and really for humanity is whether or not we get socked to it before the oceans really do. Because then we'll change. And we'll also say, hey, you scientists, why didn't you tell us? <laughs> we don't have much time. This is the best published model I can find. Actually, it's semi-empirical, which is what's really interesting. What this guy did was, you know, there's an instrumental record that overlaps the models. So you, you sort of, you go back and you sort of verify your model predictions to, see, to try and calibrate them and recalibrate them. 
And so that's what's been done here. And, and this is the range. So it's pretty hard not to get at least a meter of sea level rise. Now let me tell you the assumptions. The Greenland ice sheet is stable. Antarctica is stable. This is all just going to be little bits of melting ice here and there. But Greenland has underwater rivers, massive rivers of water flowing under the ice sheets into the ocean as we speak. So, so this good news scenario of only one meter of sea level rise is dependent upon a wishful thinking which is absurd. Uh, okay, I grew up down here, so I can say it. <clears throat> I'm really from New York, though, so I don't care that much. Um, <laughs> 10 million people live there. 10 million people live there, and they're still coming. They're still building. Do you see these advertisements for the multi-million dollar condominiums in Miami Beach that are two and a half feet above sea level? Right? And it's legal. It should be illegal. We shouldn't rebuild the Rockaways. We shouldn't be doing any of that because it's, I mean, that's, that's a Navy problem. How are you guys going to handle the evacuation from that? Because, because it's not going to happen because the sea level slowly rises like the water in a bathtub with a little drip, drip, drip. It's going to happen in one hell of a storm, right? OK, so the New York Times read, ran these. And forgive me if you all attentively read the op-ed column of the New York Times every day. But I'm going to go through four of these because they're amazing. Um, I left out the present conditions because I assume we all vaguely know where Miami and Boston and New Orleans and New York City are. With only five feet of sea level rise, a meter and a half, sort of a best guess for 2100, Miami Beach is 94% gone. That's assuming a flat ocean with no waves. And Miami is 20%. You add a little bit, you know, you double that, and whoa. And even with only five feet, the city of Miami is an island. New Orleans, the tragedy of New Orleans. We are about to spend, I don't know how many tens of billions of dollars to defend New Orleans. Should we really do that? I mean, it's a wonderful culture, it's rich, it's whatever. Is it kind or cruel to rebuild people's homes in places that will be destroyed forever in the next really bad hurricane. And you don't need, even need to wait for 12 feet in New Orleans. I went to try and raise money from a bunch of people in Baton Rouge who were in the oil business, and I knew they wouldn't give me any money. So they said, what's your book about? And I said, it's going to be about Baton Rouge being the southern coastline of Louisiana. And in a totally straight face, he looked at me and said, we know that already. We're hiring the Dutch engineers. OK, I went to Yale, so it doesn't bother me that Harvard and MIT are going to be underwater. <laughs> but now New York. New York is the best of the four. But what just happened in New York? So it's not just the sea level rise, right? It's the interaction with all that other stuff. This is major, 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 major. If that event in Florida happened, Florida's estate will be bankrupt. It will be evacuated. The United States economy will go into depression. There is not enough insurance money in the world to rebuild the city of Miami. This is big. OK, so how can we avoid this? Um, I'm almost done because it's a very short list. <laughs> uh, and it's really easy. 
You know, number one, accept the fact that continuous economic growth is unsustainable. There's something called a global footprint. It is a metric of how much of the Earth's renewable resources we use every year. Currently, we are using 150% of the Earth's renewable resources every year. Could you run your bank account that way? But we just keep doing it. And the problem is we don't know how to have a stable government and have people employed without growth. We define a depression as zero growth, but we're using 150% of what's available for us to use. That's a fundamental problem in governance. We have to address all of the things simultaneously because they interact, and none of this is possible. You know, we all, my wife and I were really proud because we bought a hybrid. You know, hybrids are great, but the answer is the bus, right? I mean, the, the magnitude of change that's implied by all this is, is huge. So I'm going to go through the list, just because I th I've thought about this a lot. And you can think about how possible it is. But if you believe anything I just told you, I think it'll be obvious that we have to do what's on the lists, or that horrible thing is going to happen. So this is the easy one. Make fishing ecologically sustainable. We could enforce the law. That would be really a good first step. And we don't do it here either, you know. We could ban harmful fishing practices. In other words, that destroy the natural capital. They destroy the goose that laid the golden egg. So, but what does that mean? Never again trawling, never again longlining, never again purse -saining. Can you imagine the howl of the fishermen? But if we don't do that, there really will be no fish because there are already almost no fish because of those things. We have to make at least one-third of the entire global ocean off-limits. We're arguing about 5%. And we have to eliminate the subsidies we actually pay fishermen to overfish. And we got to stop that. But the most important challenge is, you know, there's more than 6 billion people, right? We're going to hit 9. Uh, you just can't. We can't do that Christ thing, right? We can't divide the fishes. I mean, we cannot feed people with what's naturally available. We have to figure out how to farm it. And we have to figure out how to farm it in a sensible and responsible way. Agriculture, it's sort of the same thing. We know how to do this too. Um, tax, uh, I know that's a really bad word, but Tax the use of fertilizers, pesticides, and animal waste proportional to the harmful effects. I'm a corn farmer in Iowa making ethanol, which is vitally important to the future security of the country, and my pocketbook. And I use all this fertilizer, and I flush it down the toilet called the Mississippi River, and it goes boom, 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 boom down to the Gulf of Mexico and kills fish or does whatever. And I don't pay for that. Okay. Uh, eliminate agricultural subsidies, which, whoa, the farm bill? And ban outright the use of persistent pesticides that harm ecosystems and human health. If you want to be really freaked out, uh, read a book called Our Stolen Future about the total disruption of human reproduction. And it's out there. I haven't been able to really verify it. I've found two sources. But it's out there that the sperm count, the average sperm count in the West has dropped 50% since I was a kid. And just go to a, I used to teach at Johns Hopkins, and the fastest growing part of Johns Hopkins Hospital is the fertilization clinic because of the exploding problems of failure to conceive. But the most important thing with agriculture is to make it green. We talk about the green revolution, but it's a, it's not very green. OK, and then this is a joke. I almost don't have the courage to read it to you. Uh, we could enforce the law again. That would be good. Uh, we could tax fossil fuels the way other countries do. We could provide incentives and, and do all the rest of it. But you know it's so bad that what we really need 
is to figure out how to put the genie back in the bottle. And, and, and if I, what's the name of the guy who owns Virgin Airlines, you know, and he has this wonderful, huge prize? Well, there should be a prize out there for $1 billion cold cash for anybody who can figure out how to put carbon dioxide back into a liquid or solid form in a safe way. I mean, on an industrial scale. I mean, because if that doesn't happen, it is going to be three or four degrees warmer. OK, so I guess I've convinced you that, I hope I have, um, that we're in a big mess. And it's hard to see it here in our comfortable homes. It's really hard to see. But go to Brazil, or go to Bangladesh, or go to any of these places. Go to West Africa. You can almost see the Sahara advancing south. Go to Mexico, to the agricultural fields that are failing year after year after year. And those are not just their problems. Those are our problems, because they, you know, they're global stability things and all the rest. So all this bad stuff is happening, and it's happening faster and faster. It's sort of a, a runaway process. And we don't need more science, you know? I mean, the problems are not scientific. They're social, they're economic, and they're political. We know what to do to, I mean, I'm not saying it's easy. How do you stop using gasoline to get around when you're utterly committed to highways and cars? It's not going to happen overnight. I mean, that's obvious, but we could start, right? I mean, we could try, which we have never seriously tried to do. We are all guilty. We all benefit from this stuff. It's fine to say, oh, you know, somebody else should do this. But every time you, you know, we in this country, we consume twice as much energy per capita than Western Europeans. And, you know, I don't know if you've, I mean, the French live better than we do. And they somehow do it for half as much energy. I mean, we just, we're profligate. Think about going into a Walmart and all that stuff nobody needs, right? That was made in China out of plastic, burning energy, increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Why? Because it's called growth. The alternative to not doing anything is what I've been saying. A hothouse world, billions of climate refugees, and that means trouble, and economic collapse. And so the question is, do we respond? Are we capable of rational thought as human beings? I mean, because, you know, if you, you don't believe me in the ponytail, you can read it in nature, you can read it in science, you can read it in the economist, for God's sakes. You know, this is not, this isn't news anymore. It's just that we were in shock and we don't know what to do. Um, I personally believe that we could do a lot of these things. I personally believe that um, the, that, that Sandy was a big wake-up call. We watched, we watched a very um, opposite side of the fence governor of a state have uh, an epiphany, seeing the people he obviously cared about from his state suffering on a massive scale that had clearly been unimaginable. And that was the tip of the iceberg. And we just have to hope that there are more and more people on both sides of the aisle who understand that these are not things that you can put off, but actually represent, I would say, the greatest threat to the future security of the United States of America is not China, is not Iran, is not Iraq. It's sea level rise and all that other stuff. Because when it happens, the magnitude is just going to be unimaginable. So one way or another, you know, people will still be around. Um, the question is, what will the Earth be like? Would you even want to be there? And the other question is, who will be around to enjoy it or not? Because it's really sort of up for grabs. Thank you.
Yeah. <laughs> yes. I think this works. Yes. It does. There you go. Thank you very much for your presentation, which was horrifying. Um, <laughs> You, you, you did make your point. Um, Carlene Leiden Kloss with the North American Marine Environment Protection Association. We talked specifically about uh, impacts that are going to directly affect the United States. We have a global problem here. How effective are organizations like UNEP, or are there organizations that could be effective on a global level? Or are you talking about solutions act locally? I think in countries like this, when things get really bad, we have a remarkable capacity to respond locally. So for example, in the Gulf of Maine, which is literally a disaster from a fisheries point of view, you start to see these people getting together who are smart, have thought about it, and are thinking about how to put together a program that would restore the Gulf of Maine to at least some of its further bounty. And occasionally it happens like, like I was just, um, I just went diving with Sylvia Earle in a place called Cabo Pulmo in the southern Gulf of California where a bunch of people from a fishing village realized they were catching minnows and they set aside 14 kilometers of their coast and turned it into a reserve, and they did that over 20 years ago. And Sylvia and I were swimming through schools of 2,500 fish this big, and the corals look beautiful, and it was fantastic. So I think there's room for local action, but this is huge. And when you, th you think about, I think the greatest role of local action is political. I think the greatest lo role of local action is to say, if you don't recognize this is a real problem, I'm not going to vote for you the next time around because, <clears throat> because whether we like it or not, um, it's going to take the capacity of the structural capacity of major nations to start to drive the change. You know, the, the technology that will allow for much cleaner en energy production isn't just going to happen overnight in a little shed somewhere. So um, we are going to have to invest massively in, in making these kinds of changes. But I, I think that the, the Gulf of Maine, the Cabo Pomo example, they're really important because they do show that you can get a tangible result. The, I often get the reaction, I mean, I hate to give this talk. I, I've, I've lowered it down to four times a year because I get depressed. And then I go drink, you know, and that's not good for my health. But um, I often get the comment that, oh my God, what can I do? And in the US context, my answer is, think about who you vote for. Because we have the luxury in our wonderful society that we have a process that can make a difference. Um, and I think we already see that happening to some degree in Europe. But you know, it's still baby stuff. And, and, um, but what will the people of New York say? I mean, this isn't gonna go away. Even if they vote in $50 billion more relief, that's only gonna pay half the costs uh, of just a storm um, in a place that doesn't have as big of a sea level rise problem. So I, I think, my personal hope, this is going to sound macabre, my personal hope is something really big and really bad will happen in a developed country so that we can't slough it off and say, oh, it's those funny people who live over there that would never happen to us. Um, I don't think New Orleans was enough. Sandy might have been. You now, there's a very different dialogue going on now. And um, that's a really good step in the right direction. I cheered you all up so very, very much. <laughs> yes. When we listen to what you're saying, most of us 
you know, we listen and we sort of imagine what you're talking about. Uh, my wife and I, about 12 years ago, were in Boca Grande, and that seashore you showed looked a lot like Boca Grande. And frankly, we woke up one morning and both of us had severe colds. So we called the local clinic to say, have we caught something? What's here? And they said, well, you're experiencing red tide. Yes. It's exactly what you said. I mean, it's, it was incredible. Yeah. It was, we couldn't breathe. They said, well, asthmatics have to leave and go inland. And so my question is, how many, has this been going on for generations? Or is this something that's only happened recently, the last few years? And is there something that can be done? Because, I mean, that's, that's a dramatic impact. The, there, yeah, there always were red tides. It's a perfectly natural phenomenon. Uh, Ponce de Leon described a red tide, or the people with him. But they sure as hell didn't happen as often as they did, and they uh, do now, and they, they weren't as persistent. Uh, the organisms were always there. Every once in a while, in a natural way, there'd be a concentration of nutrients in the right um, meteorological and oceanographic conditions to have a red tide. But, um, but it, is, it is a profoundly new thing in its magnitude. And, and the woman I mentioned, Nancy Rabelais, who won a MacArthur Award for the Dead Zone stuff, as you can imagine, the agricultural industry doesn't like her very much. And um, she's been very deeply challenged. And she did this very cool study. And she published it as a paper that says, sediments tell the history. And what she did was poke holes into the Mississippi Delta with cores. And then there are all these things we call biomarkers, which are chemical signatures of particular organisms or whatever. And she demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that this problem began, you know, just around the time of the Second World War when this massive influx of artificial industrial produced fertilizers were being injected <clears throat> into the system. Um, we now have a really good biomarker for the dinoflagellates that cause uh, red tides, and people are starting to study this, and they'll, they'll end up showing the, uh, the same thing. Um, I, did, I didn't over-dramatize it, but um, a guy named Ken Weiss wrote a, a really great series. It was called uh, Altered Oceans. It, he won a Pulitzer Prize for it. It was on the front page of the Los Angeles Times four days in a row above the fold. So it was a, a major commitment. And, um, and I helped him a lot and helped him choose places he went out to. And he went to that place on the west coast of Florida. He came back and he said, Jeremy, I've heard you talk about it, but you don't know how bad it is. So it's, it's, it's a big deal. Yes. About 12 years ago, I went to a lecture by a person in your capacity, a PhD in marine biology, which old, and I asked him a question, which I don't mean to be ethnic, but should we, as human beings, eat uncooked fish anymore? I think the, the question is, should we eat fish anymore? Um, I mean, the sushi craze has been an eco-disaster. I mean, it tastes really good. Um, when I first got into this, and before I realized how really depressing it was, because I'd, I'd written this paper about overfishing, and people would ask me whether or not I ate fish, and I would always, and I, I still say, yes. And one of the reasons I'm out here is because I want to be able to eat fish in the future, and I'd like my kids to be able to eat it. It's a healthy food. It's, uh, it's very nutritious. Um, it's part of our culture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the problem is the expectations are totally unrealistic. You know, the, the price of fish is still cheap. The marketplace is failing because we're eating other people's fish. So 
And the major fishing countries in the world are Spain, Japan, um, South Korea, China. And, and they're basically taking everybody's fish. Sort of like when we declared the 200 mile limit when the Russian factory ships used to come in on the Grand Banks and fish the cod. So because we're wealthy, we can afford to eat other people's fish, which used to be their sustenance. You know that a billion people in the world depend on artisanal fishing as their major source of animal protein. And we are increasingly eating their food that they depend on because of our economic power. Um, I don't think it's a matter of should we or shouldn't we. I think it's just a matter of, of uh, I mean, ethically, I have strong feelings about it. But from a practical perspective, I think it's just there are not enough fish to go around. It is profoundly unjust to steal poor people's food, which is basically what the developing world, developed world is doing right now with regard to fish. And so we have to, we find an, have to find an alternative. But I think whether it's uncooked or cooked, I don't, I don't think it makes any difference. I, I think the issue is the expectation is just profoundly out of control compared to the reality of what could be done. Back there. With all the hype, all the media hype about the storm Sandy, I don't think that they've ever made the connection between this problem and the storm. I think that, that, well, you know, I'm a biologist and I talked a lot about all the things that affect sea creatures that most people don't give a damn about. Um, and that's why I think this sea level rise thing is such an amazing hook, because that's something people do think about. And it just so happens that, well, I gave a big talk, a prize talk, at the big coral reef meetings in Australia in, in July. And, and I had this little slogan, which was basically, what's good for people is good for coral reefs, and vice versa. I mean. The best thing we can do for ocean conservation at this point is to think realistically about the consequences for people of all the stupid stuff we're doing. Because what we're doing that's affecting us and will increasingly affect us is the, are the same things that are affecting wildlife in the oceans and the resources of the oceans. So we're really in it together. And I think... Um, Strategically, it's probably a better idea to focus on the threat to people because we're, we have a lot of self-interest. So I think people in New York are, are sort of getting there. I mean, because, you know, they think, oh my God, what if it's a really bad hurricane? That was not a bad hurricane, it was just big. And sea level didn't even rise that much. It was only 10 feet, it could have been 25 like in the 1928 or whatever it was, New England hurricane. So, yeah. And then there. there. No, there and then there. Funny story for you. Oh. I think it's time. <laughs> I, first of all, I, I put a lot, of, um, a lot of faith in the community of faith. I think that there are a lot of uh, houses of worship here on, uh, on the island in Newport, Emanuel Church in particular, are doing a lot of work on, uh, on raising awareness of the importance of uh, our stewardship of, uh, of creation. <clears throat> but it was only a few years ago that I was attending an annual meeting of uh, a church in Boston, and the, uh, the gentleman who had just be, been elected to become a warden of his church uh, came from a long line of uh, fishing uh, families in Gloucester. Uh, his his uh, fish sticks are sold around the world. Uh, he noted that the gospel for that day had been from, uh, from Matthew, in which Jesus told the fishermen, well, if you're not catching any fish here, throw your nets over there, and sure enough, they came back with boatloads. He said um, that, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, but... Uh, 
Uh, we're having a hard time catching boatloads of fish these days. He went on to say, but we're investing in a lot of new technology, radar and, uh, and equipment, and, he said, and we have to travel around the world. But don't worry, we'll find them. Yeah. Well, you know, think, did, I don't know how many of you saw that movie, The Perfect Storm. The tragedy of The Perfect Storm was that those people were where they were. You know, um, Peter Matheson wrote an amazing book called Men's Lives about the striped bass fishermen of, of Long Island. And early in the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century, people rowed a boat off of the South Shore, stood up in their boat, and harpooned 10 foot swordfish. The reason those people were out there is because all the swordfish near shore were gone. You keep going, you go, and going. But remember that slide about how. There are no more underexploited or unexploited fisheries. They're gone. Uh, I'm, I was going to make a slide of it. I'll make a plug for an extraordinary book by a man named Jeffrey Bolster. It's called The Mortal Sea. Uh, he's one of the most distinguished historians of uh, the environment and the oceans in the world. And it's, it's the story of the fisheries of the northwestern Atlantic. It's very, very germane to around here. And those people in Gloucester ought to read that book because uh, there's no question about the way it is. The woman there and then the gentleman there. I'm a high school senior right now. And looking at the photos that you had in your presentation, I'm dreading that in the future, that ruined ocean is all I'll have to look at and all my future children will have to look at. Is there anything that young people and students can do right now? Vote. <laughs> but, I mean, and you know, I, I didn't say, I can't believe I didn't say it. I, I had a book that just came out that's called Shifting Baselines in Ocean Fisheries. The great Daniel Pauly, the greatest fisheries biologist in the world, wrote a one-page paper titled Shifting Baselines in Ocean Fisheries. And basically, what it's, I'll sum it up for you this way. Everybody, like you, everybody thinks natural is the way the world is when they're sort of a, a young adult. Unnatural is therefore all the stuff that happens in your lifetime, which is why I'm more depressing than you are. But the problem is that children don't learn from their parents and they make the same mistake. So they shift the baseline yet again and yet again. I'll give you an example. Monkfish, which are really ugly and taste really, really good, uh, one of my all-time favorite fish, monkfish are severely depleted. And they happen to have data from going back to 1960. And by law, the fishery had to be shut down because it had declined to some level below the 1960 level. Well, there's an easy solution to that. Redefine the baseline to 1980 on the grounds that, oh, those old data, they couldn't possibly have been any good. And then all of a sudden, the fishery is legal again. Well, that's what fishery scientists and managers have been doing worldwide for 100 years. They've been shifting the baseline. So you, you, what you got to do is you got to fight against that. And, and you have to challenge it. And if you care about fish, read that Bolster book, because it's really, uh, uh, he's a beautiful writer. And you know so much of the wonderful history of New England is about these remarkable people in this remarkable industry of fishing. And it's essentially a dead culture, because they nuked it. And so if you want to ever have anything back, it's going to have to be a complete reevaluation and change in everything that we do about fishing. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being here this evening. We're really enjoying your presentation. My question concerns uh, biotechnology. Can uh, genetic engineering uh, provide a possible solution for fish to be immune from any of the adverse conditions you mentioned? 
It may surprise you, but I'm sort of not anti-biotech. Um, I think I think we have a huge problem that we we love technology, so we see it as a panacea that every time we screw up, somebody will find a fix. That's my the biggest scare to me about the whole energy issue that somehow magically we'll wave our magic wand and make it go away. There's already a lot of genetic engineering of farmed salmon. Farming salmon is ecologically stupid because there are carnivores. It's sort of like raising cows to feed tigers to eat tigers. Really, I mean, you know, salmon are top predators. So we raise, you know, and so we go out and we catch all these sardines and anchovies to feed them. Um, but biotechnology and a lot of breeding has reduced the animal feed requirement for farm salmon dramatically. It's a case of an industry actually waking up and seeing that they were in trouble and although there's still huge problems with farm salmon, it's to be applauded that this major effort has been made. And a significant component of that effort has included genetic engineering of salmon to make them better able to efficiently uh, process vegetable protein rather than fish protein. So um, resistance to disease, yeah. Um, you know, why not vaccinate oysters against oyster disease or something? Um, those aren't stupid things. Those are, it's amazing how sometimes they, they really work. But think of the research effort that's required to make them happen. Think of the clock that's going tick, tick, tick. I don't think that's going to, in a major way, get us out of this mess unless we somehow admit our culpability and try to do something about it. And I think I'm going to be rescued here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Go, go, go. Sit up. Sit up. Okay. Oh. Thank you, Jeremy, very much on behalf of all the students in the Naval War College Foundation who we pride ourselves in being the Navy's home of thought, and you definitely had us thinking here tonight. It's a tradition to give you a book written by one of our distinguished faculty. We thought about it, you know, ocean apocalypse, contemporary <laughs> maritime piracy, kind of a different topic, uh, international law strategy and diplomacy at sea. But as you were talking and I was thinking, you know, a lot of the roots of the Somalian piracy is in exactly what you talked about. Oh, absolutely. People coming to take the fish, they have limited choices about how to stay alive. So we're all in this together. We'll keep working on the arena part. We'll try to keep it. You keep us thinking, keep yes, working sir. on the source part. God bless you and your family and all your efforts. We'll try to listen harder uh, as you scientists continue to, to warn us and we'll work together and uh, we'll make it better. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Thank you. Very much.